talking, continue talking about uh, plantar fascial disease here. Uh, Ash, Ash, you, what do you think of this one? Looks like there's a prominent plantar spur uh, on the calcaneus. Yeah, okay. So he's got foot pain. This was on 6-23-06. Uh, this is three years later. More, worse pain. Can you go back one? I just want to see. If... Okay. And the next one. Okay. Um, I still see that plantar spur. Maybe there's more um, sclerosis along the heel. Um, the calcaneal. I don't know. Here's the MR. Okay. All right. Well, pain three weeks after. Oh, okay. So they, they resected it. Uh, I don't think they should have. Um, and uh, it looks like that the, now it's completely torn from the uh, from the insertion. The central cord is completely torn. So here's a situation where people made a big oh, sorry about that uh, deal about the the plantar osteophyte. Uh, no MR scan was done. The patient continued to have pain, and now three years later they decided that the osteophyte was the cause of the pain. So they went in and resected the osteophyte, and he got much worse after surgery, and this is what the MR scan then showed after after surgery. So uh, the, the, the plantar osteophyte does not cause inflammatory disease. <clears throat> As I've said repeatedly, the osteophyte is a secondary phenomenon of the body trying to heal uh, the partial tears. <clears throat> and if your, the, your concept of pathophysiology is incorrect, then we'll make decisions that aren't in the benefit of the patient. And this just shows something that used to be a fairly common procedure, which was removing these plantar osteophytes back when it was thought that the osteophyte was the cause of the symptoms. Uh, because on x-rays, you can't see the, the pathology. The pathology is the tear of the plantar fascia, and you can't see that on x-rays. So we made a lot of incorrect assumptions back, uh, you know, if, if uh, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and uh, we, we need to change our concept of pathophysiology now that we've got a much better tool to evaluate it, uh, which is MRI. Okay. I don't know of any orthopedic surgeons that did this. Uh, this was done not by an orthopedic surgeon. All right. Uh, so here we have some sagittal images through the hind foot, and we can see some soft tissue edema surrounding the central band of the plantar fascia at the calcaneal attachment. I don't see a discrete tear on this image. And did this patient have neuropathy of the plantar aspect of the foot over on the lateral side? This, this patient had Baxter's neuropathy, and it just shows that... Uh, uh, the uh, edema changes that you see, and then of course the uh, uh, the plantar nerve goes right in through here, and was involved. Uh, uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? Is this for me? Yes. Sorry, Ashley. Yes. Um, uh, looks like there's. Uh... Michael's not able to participate today. Okay. Looks like there's uh, quite a bit of atrophy of the abductor digiti minimi here. Yeah. And here's what it looks like on the sagittal images. And yeah, you can see the fat, fatty atrophy, a fatty replacement there. Yeah. Um, and it's it's pretty focal. The other intrinsic muscles look normal. Yeah. So this is a, a atrophy of the focal atrophy of the abductor digiti quinti muscle. It's uh, thought to be due to entrapment of the first branch of the lateral plantar nerve, Baxter's nerve. Uh, but if you look on MRI scans, study, people have shown that in 7% of all people, even when, when they do not have symptoms referable to this area, you'll see focal fatty atrophy of the adductor digiti quinti muscle. And it's thought to be due to chronic trauma uh, uh, and uh, injury to the nerve. Uh, could occasionally it could be due to inflammatory change. Sometimes it's it's probably due to tears and secondary uh, changes around the uh, origin of the plantar fascia. But most of these patients have minimal symptoms and really does don't have a defined Baxter's neuropathy. And this is uh, pa uh, something from a paper from Michael Recht 
a number of years ago, uh, where you can see that the nerves coming down through here, right through this area. Here's the plantar fascia here. Uh, that's where the spur would be, and it goes right in through this area over and then uh, innervates the adductor digiti quinti. So we probably get trauma to this nerve uh, fairly frequently, 7% of people uh, with, with atrophy of the muscle here, and they may not have uh, any uh, actual symptoms associated with this. We, we just pick up atrophy of the digiti quinti on MR examination. Okay, so we have a 36-year-old male with bilateral plantar heel pain after a nine-kilometer hike. Um, so we have some images of the bilateral calcaneus. Um, there is some muscle edema greater on the left than the right. Um, I'm wondering if this could be some type of neuropathy or it could be overuse or muscle strain injury after a, this long of a hike. Mm -hmm. So this is this Batu's neuropathy, where the edema we're seeing here, uh, they thought, this is from Australia, they thought was due to an acute Baxter's neuropathy where the trauma uh, hurt the, uh, the nerve, uh, and you got secondary acute uh, innervation syndrome of the, of the muscle. So uh, this, in, in a sense, would be similar to Parsonage-Turner syndrome in the shoulder, which can also be painful. Uh, uh, most of the time, this is thought to resolve spontaneously on, on its own, but we know that 7% of digiti quinti muscles show uh, fatty atrophy, which is a typical sequela of chronic denervation. So m maybe some of these will become symptomatic, the symptoms will go away, and they'll just end up with muscle atrophy. Uh, this is this fatty. Uh, it, it looks like edema to me. No, this is edema. This is the acute, not the chronic phase. Right. Acute edema okay. phase. Good. Good. You, you are confusing me, John. And you know, I'm easily confused. Well, uh, no, I shouldn't confuse you, but I, I confuse a lot of people when I talk. So, so again, this just shows uh, uh, Baxter's nerve, Baxter's neuropathy, the nerve coming around here. Uh, so you see them in runners, you see them in toe athletes. They're thought to be associated with uh, heel spurs and plantar fasciitis. Uh, the, the spur is really a fixed element. I, I guess the, the, they may be associated with spurs, but the spur is probably associated with it because the spur is a sequela of trauma to the origin of plantar fascia here. So it's probably more a marker of prior trauma rather than the spur itself uh, causing this, the uh, the trauma, uh, and you get medial heel tenderness, typically late in the day, and and then the denervation atrophy of the adductor. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Patient, another patient. All these patients have heel pain. Yeah, so we can see the skin marker along the heel, and we see um, some soft tissue edema within the subcutaneous fat here. Um, I'd like to see the central cord. A little bit better. Um, it seems to be mostly just uh, superficial edema um, in the adipose and just, uh, just a, a pressure kind of lesion. Yeah. Um, but so this is commonly called heel pad syndrome, and it's really a contusion of the subcutaneous fat overlying the calcaneus. And again, it's kind of an overuse uh, syndrome. It's typically with with individuals who are relatively sedentary, and then they decide to go out and do a 10-mile hike with uh, with their grandchildren or something, and uh, the subcutaneous tissues isn't used to that kind of trauma, and and you get bruising of the subcutaneous tissues. It can be painful. Here's just another example in the coronal plane showing PD fat set and T1 weighted images. You make. Make me walk nine miles, and I'll have more than heel pain. <laughs> right, exactly. And sometimes it's interesting how, in the more chronic phases, this is better seen on the T1 than the PD fat set images because it's more a, a fibrous displacement of fat in the chronic phase rather than edema. And it's more of a chronic pressure lesion. 
Okay. So they want to know. Oh, it's not a callus. Yeah, the, the chronic thing is a callus, though. So, uh, this lesion, uh, primarily, oh, primarily no. involves the subcutaneous fat, where the callus is really thickening of the dermis, uh, but uh, they, they occur together. I was just uh, saying that, that one would not, should not think that that is a possible callus because it's definitely not. Doesn't look like it does, and 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 you would have um, prominence there, and right. you wouldn't have a difference in the uh, uh, tissue um, sensitivity. I uh, am I right? Okay. I believe this was a major league baseball trainer uh, who, uh, after being uh, out on the field at the beginning of spring training came in with increasing heel pain. Uh, uh, six months a manager. What? What? A manager? No, he, he was a trainer. Okay. okay, so he does have that transverse signal intensity, which is characteristic of a lateral slide osteotomy procedure. But in addition to that, there's a lot of edema within that superior calcaneus adjacent to the surgical site. And since this is six months postoperative, I would be concerned that he does have a stress injury or acute trabecular injury in the posterior superior calcaneus. Yeah, they were afraid that the uh, surgery might have, the surgical site might have broken down. I think the surgery was intact. This was just more diffuse trabecular bone injury because he had been maybe a little a little bit of a stress fracture coming through here, uh, but he had been uh, off it for uh, many months, uh, and uh, all of a sudden he had this increased activity on it, and this is kind of a diffuse trabecular bone injury, and it did very well just with rest. Um, uh, this Wasn't this a post-op case where he started walking too early? Uh, he had surgery six months before this, and right. he had been mostly uh, resting after the surgery. And then spring training started up, so he got out on the field and started uh, whole days up on his on his feet. Yeah, I remember uh, we had this uh, in your office, John. Could be right? an interesting case. Yeah, maybe you were here for that. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, on crutches. Uh, heel pain, rule out calcaneal fracture. I do see oblique lucency through the calcaneus on the um, Harris view. I think that's concerning for a fracture. I don't see it as well on the sagittal view. Um, hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of edema around the calcaneus. I don't see the fracture as well here. Uh, lots of edema. I guess this could be a tear of the plantar fascia or mu muscle strain, uh -huh, muscle injury. So, uh, but uh, strains of the abductor uh, halicus and flexor digitorum brevis muscles. So, uh, so we can go back again. Yeah, we were concerned about this, and since but it turned out this really was nothing on an MR examination. All of his injuries were really soft tissue. So it shows that MR can be helpful. Okay, uh, you got a vessel there or something like that, John, or what? Uh, what? Was that a vessel going through the calcaneus just was prominent? I don't know what that is. I don't either. Yeah. It, but it didn't turn out to be a fracture on the MR. Ask you. Um, so I guess it says tender palpable mass. Um, at this level, the skin marker is kind of overlying the flexor digitorum brevis, right? Um, I don't see much here oh, okay so oh there's 
there's there's like a, maybe a small fibroma within the mid plantar fascia there. Yeah, I. Uh, it's funny. I used to see these all the time, and I don't think I've seen one in uh, many months. Uh, so, I'm, go ahead, Josh. My treatment has changed, and maybe that's why you don't. Yes. Um, orthosis is a treatment nowadays. You, you rarely ever operate on these. Okay. In fact, it, it, it's discouraged surgery is. So maybe that's why you don't see it. Um, they don't bother getting MRIs. Okay. Because uh, the, 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 what the, the concept of what these are has changed a lot over the years. Uh, at one time, they were thought, or, or still some people believe that these are benign fibrous tumors. Uh, but you know, some of these we know are actually partial tears. And uh, with uh, also, often you can get a very exuberant healing response. And uh, when you look at a healing response under the microscope, you see a lot of bizarre looking fibro, fibrous cells, uh, which a lot of people called atypical cells, thinking that they were some form of a non-aggressive uh, tumor, either malignancy or benign in the past. So, <clears throat> and then with MR came along, a lot of these you could follow, develop over time. And so at least some of these were probably partial tears. I'm still, still some of them may be fibrous tumors, but I think a lot of them are partial tears, and maybe one of the reasons they're more conservative with treatment now is that's probably the ideology of a lot of these. But in the past, a lot of people thought they needed a wide resection. John? Um, pathologically, they look very much like a tumor uh, because they're hypercellular and they are mitotic figures. But um, none of these, uh, I, I guess almost none of them, are ever uh, malignant. Uh, so I've never heard of one uh, You're dealing with either a tear uh, or or a, a fibroma that's that can be quite painful yes. and can be pretty large. But uh, surgery is out because they, they recur very easily, and um, you have to have a wide uh, resection. And then you get the um, deformity of the foot. So here again, we can see intermediate T1 and slightly increased stir signal intensity along the plantar fascia. I think this is just another large plantar fibroma. Sometimes when they get large, people call them fibromatosis. Uh, my plant. Plantar fibromatosis, that's the old term. Plantar fibromatosis, you're right. Uh, so I, I i really think a lot of these are just uh, hyper-exuberant uh, healing uh, due to plantar fibril tears, but, but I'm um, biased in but the they, they keep growing, John, so I'm not sure that your theory is all. It, it may be partially true, but Certainly not in all cases. Yeah. Okay, uh, Ashu. Um, so this is a 49-year-old female. Um, we have uh, three sagittal images, low on T1 and high on fluid-sensitive sequences. It seems well circumscribed. It's heterogeneous on the T2. I'd be worried about a mass, um, kind of like, it's just fat split sign, so I guess a peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Um, but it also kind of could be a a large fibroma, but that would be, um, okay. I don't know, that would be... Yeah. yeah, I think you get, uh, uh, Kian Su likes this fat split sign, and, uh, but, but uh, as we'll see in a lot of his cases, you can see this in all kinds of mass lesions. Uh, uh, but this has very inhomogeneous, so this is certainly a lesion I'd be very concerned about. I would really want to do, get a biopsy and then do an excisional excision of it, this turned out to be a benign fibromatosis. I, I, I would have to do an excision and, and not a, a biopsy first. You say that, John? I would do an excision in total, uh, not a biopsy. 
Yeah, okay, okay, but a lot of the, well, okay. you, know, you send them to uh, places that specialize in this, but I believe a lot of these tumor surgeons now want to know the histology before they decide how aggressive their surgery is going to be. Well, the thing is, they're going to be growing, and and uh, the aggressiveness is going to be found out on a on a frozen section. Uh, it almost looks like it has an enhancing tail projecting superiorly, which is characteristic of a lot of nerve sheath tumors. That makes me think it's a neurofibroma. It's that enhancing tail. The um, it, it might be some edema there or something, but not, not, I know I'm, that's not a nerve as far as I can tell. Okay, so we have some axial and sagittal images of the ankle. Um, not sure. I, there's some muscle edema along the medial abductor house tear. Okay. Um, so male with lateral pain and swelling one week after playing volleyball. Um, question fasciotomy. There's a uh, increased signal within the Abductor halysis. Um, Just one second. Michael's calling. Let me see. Hi, oh. Michael. Okay, let's continue here. Okay, so the question here uh, that was uh, asked by the orthopedic surgeon was, do they need to do a fasciotomy? So... What do you think, Ashu? Uh, no, I don't think so. It looks like there's a lot of, oh, I see. Well, if they're worried about compartment syndrome and there's focal edema within the abductor halysis muscle. Right. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know how this would come about, but um, I, I think I, I I, I think I might be concerned. I would do a pressure. Can't you measure the, uh, the pressure within the fascial compartment? Um, Yes. I mean, John, do you want to say something about compartment syndrome? I've never seen it in the foot. Yeah. I, I'd never seen it in the foot either. So this was kind of discussed. And I think they ended up not doing a fasciotomy. And I, I'm not exactly sure what happened, but my, I believe the patient did, did fine just with uh, uh, rest. I, I think I would um, possibly biopsy this. Was it um, sudden or? Uh, one week after playing volleyball. Oh, well. So uh, I'm people, not sure if volleyball caused it. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, uh, they certainly can do pressure measurements. And I don't, unfortunately, I don't remember whether they actually did pressure measurements in this patient. Um, um, what, what, what uh, I, I don't know of any compartment syndrome that looks like this to you? Well, they can look like this. I'm just not familiar with with having a j just the muscle fascia being strong enough to cause a compartment syndrome. Usually it's a much larger compartment with much thicker fascia than this. Yeah, this is just a... Um, conservatively, and I, I believe he did okay. Yeah, it's just a, 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 a edema. Yeah. Maybe, uh, yeah. but uh, but it, it it includes the skin too, so it's yeah. All right. All right. Um, it looks like there's fluid signal intensity between the fourth and fifth metatarsals, so I guess this could be intermetatarsal bursitis or. Muscle strain. Okay, so then this could be muscle strain of the interosseous muscles. Yeah. 
was in the was in Hyperton. Here's the T1, here's the stir sequence. And so here's another interosseous muscle tear. So this is a patient who had uh, pain on the plantar aspect of the first uh, digit issue. Um, so we're looking at the flexor tendon here. There's there's some increased signal um, at the skin marker, and um, and I think there might be a plantar plate injury uh, um, of a you know a lesser plantar plate injury. Yeah, so th this actually was a tear, and you can see a little proximal retraction. This is the the uh, the plantar plate here. It was torn here and retracted back a little bit. Yeah, flexor tendon. Okay. All right, ankle pain one year ago after motocross riding, and there's a lot of subcutaneous swelling along the medial malleolus. Uh, the adjacent bone looks Okay, so there's a fluid collection along the medial malleolus. I'm not sure if this is like a, a false bursa, bursitis. Yeah. Adventitional bursopathy. Uh, it, it's basically a, a chronic morel lavalet type lesion. And sometimes it's hard to get these to the base, the uh, deep fascia to adhere back down again uh, with these. They need to be drained and pressure until that that, uh, that deep membrane uh, re uh, re reconnects, and uh, otherwise you'll you'll get chronic fluid collections in there that are difficult to. Okay. okay, let's go on and talk about impingement syndromes. So there are kind of seven impingement syndromes uh, that uh, people talk about around the ankle. Uh, basically, lateral, anterolateral, anterior, anterior, medial, medial, posterior, medial, and posterior. So basically, all the way around. Uh, the the pathophysiology is you you have either bony anomalies which produce uh, impingement due to bony impingement. You can have ossicles. You can have osteophytes, or you can have soft tissue thickening and scar tissue and fibrous tissue as a cause of it. So if we start laterally, we've already talked a little bit about this uh, syndrome. Uh, here we can see, uh, well, let me see. You got, uh, who's next? Ashu? Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, it looks like there's uh, impingement laterally between the distal fibula and the calcaneus, and there's a lot of uh, angulation. Yeah. Um, so, so we have uh, a heel valgus. We already talked about that before. And, and mm -hmm. then uh, a measurement you, you'd measure. As this goes more, you'll, you'll start getting edema patterns here with it, where the distal fibula uh, keeps impacting upon the lateral aspect of the calcaneus. And what's the uh, most common cause of this? Um, I mean, could, could you get this from uh, PTT dysfunction um, uh, resulting in uh, pes planus? And or is this is this just prior to uh, an ankle a prior ankle trauma and sprain? This is kind of closer to the end stage of adult acquired fat foot deformity, which is primarily dysfunction of the posterior tibialis tendon. So you no longer have the medial tug on the calcaneus, and it starts uh, uh, going into valgus, and you get bony deformities as the bones remodel due to the the change in the stress pattern on the bones. Uh, so this is uh, really typically most commonly a part of adult onset uh, flat foot deformity. Okay, so here we can have severe lateral impingement with edema and osseous remodeling within the fibula and adjacent calcaneus. And we can see a collapse of the midfoot and loss of that normal arch. And severe degenerative changes. Yeah. And here's another example on a low field. Again, but the same process. All this degenerative disease here, uh, due to the fact that the PTT is no longer hasn't been functional for years, and you get extensive bony remodeling, and then that's the alpha angle, and if it's greater than six, it's abnormal.
for Hill Valgus. We've talked about this before. A little repetition, I guess, doesn't hurt. Ashu. Um, here we can see, uh, sorry, one sec. Uh, it looks like there is a skin marker along the lateral malleolus. I see some soft tissue edema um, and some angulation of the calcaneus. Is this, again, lateral impingement? Well, what's causing this? Um, we're looking at, if we're looking at the posterior tibial, I don't see the posterior tibials very well here. Um, oh, there's a fracture. <laughs> okay. So, so there are other causes besides PTT disease, and one of those are fractures that haven't healed well, and the deformity from the fracture. So uh, that's one of the reasons why these uh, distal fibular fractures are usually treated by internal fixation. And you get some lateral impingement. Okay, another lateral impingement after trauma. All right. Um, so it looks like there's cortical breakthrough and a displaced fracture fragment along the inferior lateral aspect of the talus, and that abuts the distal fibulus. This is acute fracture. Often we see it in the chronic phase. And this is what it looked like about four years later. Uh, so here there is some osseous bridging, but there's still cortical irregularity, and their distal fibula does abut the talus, and there's edema within the talus. Um, so if these fractures don't heal properly, you end up with chronic bony impingement. And... Uh, with that, you get this ebernation uh, of the bones, and you can get chronic stress injuries because now the forces going through the ankle are abnormal uh, because of the deformity, because that fracture didn't heal properly. Uh, so this is lateral impingement, uh, not this time not due to a fracture of the fibula, but due to a fracture of the calcaneus. And this, neither the, the these fractures are not that uncommon. And, but most of the time when I've seen this, it's been in the chronic phase and and because uh, it, it wasn't, the fracture wasn't properly managed at the beginning. Okay. So the pathophysiology, you get it's typically due to some abnormal trauma and any mechanism of abnormal trauma can do it. And with the soft tissue injuries, you can get tears. Uh, if you continue to have instability, you get hypertrophic uh uh, granulation tissue that becomes fibrotic, and you get these wads of fibrous tissue uh, uh, with re re trauma, and you could get, also get hypertroph hypertrophied synovium if it's adjacent to the joint. And then this ends up what's called a highline meniscoid lesion and, and also associated osteophytes. And the meniscoid lesion is highly vascularized, so this the soft tissue and the, the soft tissue can be very tender and the osteophytes can cause impingement on that, producing chronic pain syndromes. And that's what occurs uh, not medial laterally or anterior posteriorly, but at the oblique corners. So anterior lateral impingement is really a soft tissue impingement, not a bony impingement due to this meniscoid lesion or hypertrophic scar tissue developing uh, in the region of the anterior talofibular ligament, typically from recurrent inversion injuries. So this is what it looks like. Nice article from Sarazol from Spain on this back in AGR a few years ago. And here uh, you can see this is a big kind of uh, fibrous mass here associated with just superior to the anterior talofibular ligament, which developed from prior trauma. Another example here where we can see the anterior talofibular ligament, there should be a fat pad deep to it, but this is now all scar tissue. Uh, which is produce produce product pain in this area. That's what it looked like on the coronal image, that water scar tissue. When you go in arthroscopically, you just have this mass of, of scar tissue, and then the treatment for that is to debreed it, remove the scar tissue, uh, so that you d you don't have that the bones impinging upon the scar tissue producing pain. And then anteriorly, we go back primarily to bony impingement anteriorly. Uh, 
uh, here's a patient who has a flat foot deformity, a lot of degenerative disease here. But what you get for this anterior impingement, you get osteophytes on the anterior aspect of the tibial plafond, plafond and the dorsal aspect of the talus uh, from chronic repetitive trauma in this location, and that can produce impingement. And you, can, you see this often in older athletes. So, so this is an arthrogram. Okay. And this is a stir sequence. And Got this it. is a T1 sequence. Okay. Um, so we can see a steata process. There is some mild marrow edema within the steata process. We could correlate for symptoms of posterior impingement. And then there's diffuse marrow edema throughout the anterior um, talus and also some along the posterior distal tibia. Um, yeah, there's degenerative changes of the talonavicular joint. Um, stir artifact. Oh, I see. That's just contrast. Stir is, is kind of a dangerous sequence when you put in contrast mm -hmm. because the suppression of the signal of the stir is based upon the T1 time of the tissue, not whether it has fat in it. And well, the, the a lot of, time of contrast is often similar to that of fat, so often the contrast will be suppressed and it's not fat. John? Um, the disease of this foot, uh, osteophytes at the various joints. Yeah, there's a lot of degenerative disease here. Okay. So it almost looks like... It's just a prominent osteophyte along the talus. I don't think that's beaking. Um, it's all the degenerative disease and anterior impingement. It's uh, ankle impingement, and this was a Major League Baseball player at that particular time. Ashley, what do you think of this one? Here we can see uh, quite a bit of uh, pro some prominent osteophytes along the dorsal aspect of the talus anteriorly as well as along the, um, the distal anterior tibia. Um, and you can see some uh, a lot of fluid there and edema. So th this is concerning for anterior impingement as well. Yeah, so this is classic. Loose body. Boy, John? Is, isn't there a loose body? And, um... uh, well, th this, is right there. Yeah. this is the subcutaneous fat right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's it. I'll be lying. Yeah. So, so what you see, due to chronic repetitive trauma, the bone tries to heal the injury, and it heals it by hypertrophic foam formation on both the anterior tibial plafond and the uh, distal and uh, dorsal uh, uh, talus. Uh, you, you get, as you get more and more trauma, the body develops more and more hypertrophic bone, and you end up getting these large osteophytes, and you can see where they impact one another right here, and the bone edema associated with the injury to the bone when it impacts. The tibia Taylor joint is almost non-existent. Right, and you can see there's a complete loss of articular cartilage here, a lot of subchondral bone edema uh, in the uh, mortis joint as well. So this is kind of an end-stage degenerative uh, ankle, uh, but the predominant finding here is one of chronic anterior impingement and typical bony impingement. If we keep going around, uh, the anterior medial impingement is typically soft tissue impingement here. Uh, so this is anterior and medial, and uh, typically you'll get uh, thick and soft tissue over in this region. This, again, comes from Sarazal's paper. Uh, <clears throat> this was a... Uh, Oh, sorry. Here. What do you think? Okay, so four months of anterior medial pain, an avid runner. Um, there is some soft tissue thickening and prominence there along the anteromedial ankle. So I guess this could be anteromedial impingement. The adjacent flexor tendons are intact. Here again, we can see the effacement of fat and soft tissue thickening. This was anterior medial impingement due to the repetitive trauma from running. Ashu. Um, here we're looking along the anterior medial border, um, and we can see that there is quite a bit of thickening uh, deep to the posterior tibialis tendon. 
um, kind of in the region of um, the spring ligament, um, but a little bit more superiorly. Um, I'm, I'd be worried about an anterior medial impingement in this case. It's complete effacement of the fat. We can see a little bit um, of the donation of the medial malleolus here as well. Maybe a little osteophyte, but the big yeah. thing here is, is the... Is could, the could there be a little bit of instability in these joints? Certainly could be, John. I, I have a feeling that that's a lot of uh, the pathology here. Yeah, these are typically people who have recurrent ankle sprains, and these are injuries they get from recurrent sprains. And yeah, I'll teach them to run. <laughs> and then we go to the medial side, and again, since we're straight anterior, posterior, medial, lateral, this is going to be medial, then we think more in terms of bones. Um, there's a permanent osteophyte along the medial aspect of the talus. Um, and it seems like there's some edema there between the talus and the medial malleolus. This could be a medial impingement. And it's due to an old, probably an old fracture of the medial side of the talus uh, with abnormal healing. Like we saw on the lateral side, this is the medial side, and they have a very similar appearance, except here the osteophyte is banging against the medial malleolus. On the lateral side, it bangs against the distal fibula. And then if you look at the ankle mortis, uh, it, it's angulated. Uh, yeah, and it's not flat across here, but it's because it's rebottled because yeah. it no longer sits properly because of the body impingement here medially. But it's uh, probably instability that started all this. Yeah, well, yep. On a, on a lateral side. Uh, and so the mortise is uh, going uh, medially. And, and, uh, you know, and there's a big gap there, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, maybe there was some deformity to begin with, uh, or but probably trauma. Yeah, I think it's different. We're not having a whole history on these. Yeah. And then we go posterior medially. Again, we're talking about soft tissue injuries in these uh, oblique areas, and we can see a lot of uh, soft tissue thickening here posterior medially. And this can also produce chronic pain. Again, I think all of these uh, abnormalities are due to repetitive trauma. And uh, uh, yeah. And then we go to posterior impingement, which can be caused by a number uh, of other uh, factors. In fact, I think there are like seven uh, common uh, causes of posterior impingement. One is a prominent sciatic process. Another is a prominent ostrigonum. As we've talked about before, ostrigonum, many of these, probably most of them, are due to old fractures of the steata process. Some people believe that the ostrigonum is actually congenital. But uh, uh, my guess is, since the ostrigonum seem to be a lot more common in adults and not very common in kids, in my experience, I think most of these are probably old fractures. Fracture of the lateral tubercle of the talus. Uh, can also produce posterior impingement as well as lateral impingement. Prominent posterior tubercle of the tibia, calcified inflammatory tissue posteriorly, prominent surface uh, of the calcaneus, and then a prominent tibial slip. So let's talk, look at some of these processes. And here's what uh, all these different things. This would be an ostrigonum, prominent steata process, probably a fractured ostrigonum, prominent posterior lip of the, of the uh, tibia, uh, some uh, bony osteophytes there, and hypertro hypertrophy of the dorsal aspect of the calcaneus, uh, which you can see in chronic uh, Achilles tendinopathy, which we talked about before. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this? Um, this looks like a prominent steater process. Um, this uh, uh, there's some edema within it, and there's also a posterior subtalar joint effusion. So, yeah, yeah. So this is a probably state of process. Posterior ankle pain. Okay. Looks like another prominent state of process with increased fluid in the posterior subtalar joint, and also there's a prominent 
posterior distal tibia, so... A subtle case here, Ashu. What do you think's going on here? Um, that looks a, a very large theater process, um, kind of hooked down, almost like an osteophyte. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, fusion posteriorly. Yeah, and a little bit of urbanation here, probably a little strain in this area. So this is a prominent steatal process. Uh, so here we can see a chronic appearing fracture of this steatal process with corticated fracture margins and fluid surrounding that fragment. Okay. Fractured state of process as the cause of nos trigonum. Ashu, what do you think of this one? This is a large os trigonum. Um, almost looked like it might have been a fractured state of process. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, you can clearly see uh, that this conforms to what a state of process would be. So this is almost clearly a fracture of the state of process. Mm -hmm. And then notice you've got the osteophyte formation back here where you've had abnormal trauma, the steatal process against the calcaneus, and it eventually caused the fracture. And this is what it looks like on an MR What's examination. What's interesting is the distal, distal, what's interesting is the distal tibia doesn't look uh, involved in, but this is, of course, a CAT scan. Yeah. And that doesn't tell us everything because there are some s small spurs all around that ankle. Yeah, this is the same I'm patient. With the John, this is the MR here. Wow, there we go. Yeah, and there you, you can see your tibial involvement on the MR. Yeah. They're kissing these lesion. Yeah. We'll, we'll coin that uh, word. Uh, <laughs> So this is a trigonum kissing lesion, all three of them. There you go. Okay. okay One so wonders when, when it was fractured, though. That'd be interesting to find out. Yeah, it looks like it's not hurt. Uh, one of the problems about um, uh, the, these particular lesions that we're looking at right now uh, removing uh, uh, these bones that are causing pain uh, quite frequently does not relieve the symptoms. That's uh, the unfortunate uh, part about them. Um, and I'm not sure I know how to figure out which one will do well if you do remove them. Uh, I think I have to look for other pathology than just uh, what what astrogonum is. Um, so here we can also see a steatal process with osteophytosis between the posterior talus and the calcaneus. Um, so this is compatible with posterior impingement and well, the articulation is quite uh, abnormal. Yes. This is someone who is in a small extremity scanner, so you have to, in order to get the foot in, the foot has to, foot has to be plantar flexed, so it shows you the position where the impingement occurs, uh, and this and the edema here of the bone. Okay. Uh -huh. Ashu, this patient also had posterior ankle pain. Uh, can you go back to the last one, John? Are we getting what? How is it getting plantar flex? Because it looks like it's opening up a little bit anteriorly. I'd, I'd love to see an x ray on this uh, in foot plantar flex. It's pointing down in the same direction as the tibia, so this is a plantar flexed ankle so they can fit in the tube of the extremity scanner. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah. And they, they... Okay, all right, uh, Ashu, patient also with posterior ankle pain. Um, I'm just looking here along the um, 
posterior aspect of the tibia. Um, almost looks like there might be some an extra tendon there. Okay. Um, so this is a ligament. This is the posterior yeah. slip across here. But if we look there, there's this big structure in that location. And if we go to the sagittal images, which is an easier way to look at this, here we can see these are the, the I think I have an anatomy slide of the, of the ligaments back here in a minute. Uh, that looks relatively normal. Uh, but as we go over more and more toward the lateral side, it starts getting more prominent. Here's the steata process. And as we go farther over toward the fibula, this is getting much bigger. And notice the hibernation on the steata process right next to this big thickened ligament. And that's what it looks like on the uh, stir images with a little bit of edema and steata process. Uh, and then when you get over closer to the lateral side, it's very large pushing right down on the steata process. And this is uh, posterior impingement, not so much due to bony abnormality, but a large, what's called a tibial slip. And un unfortunately, I guess I don't have the, the anatomy here. Uh, the, uh, there are uh, three ligaments in the posterior aspect of the ankle here. One goes obliquely uh, from the medial side to the lateral side and attaches to the, the uh, distal fibula here. And this oblique ligament is called the slip. And sometimes it will become hypertrophied, probably due to repetitive trauma, and can then impinge on the steata process, producing a chronic posterior pain syndrome. So that's the last one. And so this is the one that's a, primarily a soft tissue impingement on the dorsal. So if you have anterior, posterior, medial, or lateral, that's almost all bony, unless you have a large posterior slip. I think these are quite uncommon. If you have anterior lateral, anterior medial, and posterior uh, medial, it's typically a soft tissue cause and not bony cause. So why don't we stop here, and we'll look at different boat injuries around the ankle uh, starting in 2001. So we won't have any more pictures uh, and 2020.